everyone. Welcome to Amberley Presbyterian Church's online service. We are super thrilled to have you join us this morning. If you have any questions at all about the types of things that we can offer you, then please don't hesitate to reach out and uh, check out our online website, which is www.amberleychurch.ca. And as always, we would be honoured to pray for you. So if you're going through a tough time right now, and you need a little bit of extra love and support showered upon you, then please feel free to reach out to us because uh, we would love to do that. Thank you also for all the tremendous support that you have provided us uh, over the years and always, and especially during this uh, challenging time that we're all going through. Uh, if you'd like to continue supporting us uh, financially, then please feel free to do so via the website or even at the church, which is at 1820 Whites Road. So without further ado, let's start the service. It's a wonderful day and uh, let's begin with the call to worship. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Your it's friendship, friendship, just a perfect friendship. When other friendships have been forgot, ours will still be hot. Well, good morning, Amberly, and welcome back. We are in part three of our sermon series entitled Friendship in the Time of COVID. But before we do anything else, would you join me as we pray? Holy God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts would bring glory and honor to you, O Rock and our Redeemer. Amen and amen. So if you've been tracking with us, you will recall that the key verse for this series is taken from Proverbs 13, verse 20, where Solomon writes this, Walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm. Essentially, what he's saying is, you show me your friends and I will show you the trajectory of your life because you will become like the people that you spend the most time with. So if you hang around with those who are passionate and positive and faith-filled, well, you will become more passionate, positive, and full of faith. On the other hand, if you hang around people who are negative and critical and have bad attitudes, you're very likely going to get sucked down to that level and you're going to become more negative, more critical, and full of bad attitude. You show me your friends and I will show you the trajectory of your life. So last week we talked about three types of poverty. We talked about material poverty, uh, and we, we all know what that is. Uh, the second type of poverty um, that we talked about is spiritual poverty. And so you can have all of the material wealth in the world, uh, but if you have no um, eternal hope, you are spiritually poor. The third type of poverty that we talked about is something that we're probably feeling more of uh, than ever before um, as we continue to isolate because of this season of COVID. And let's be honest, it was around BC, right? Before COVID. And the third type of poverty is relational poverty. We talked last time about how relational poverty is sweeping across the developed Western world. It seems that the more financial blessings, the more material blessings that people have, the more we are losing the blessing of relationships. And there's a lot of reasons as to why. One of them is that our society celebrates and strives for independence. You know, I don't want to depend on anybody. I don't want to need anything from anybody. I want to be independent. So much so that we forget that to be independent is to be distinctly non-Christian. Because God did not create us to be independent, but instead to depend on God and people and the people of God's family. Jesus died for us and loves the church and we together are to serve one another, love one another, to exhort one another. We are to lift one another up. To be independent is really to be distinctly non-Christian. In fact, 
even in our language, and I believe sometimes we don't communicate the, the fullness of what God wants, in the church world we'll say, well, you need to have a personal relationship with God, which is true, but it's also incomplete. Never just settle for a personal relationship with God because there's actually something even richer, and that is a shared relationship with God. Wherever two or three gathered together in his name, there he is in the midst of them. What's even better than experiencing God on our own is experiencing the glory and the power and the majesty and the goodness and the character of God in the context of a broader, deep biblical community. And yet, the reality is that so few people have that. In our culture today, we have so many external blessings and yet so many people internally are relationally impoverished. Why is that? Uh, so let me give you uh, the top three reasons I think people are relationally impoverished today based on just a little bit of research that I've done. Um, number one is increased mobility. Uh, we just don't stay in one place very long anymore. The average North American moves once every five years. If you're between the ages of 20 and 40, you move on average once every three years. It's really hard to have a long-term relationship or relationships if we don't stick around, right? Number two, modern conveniences. Okay, now just think about this. I read a book some years ago now that talked about how the air conditioner massively changed community friendship. Before the air conditioner, where did people hang out, right? In the evening, they hung out on their front yard outside because it was cooler, right? Everybody was, hey, neighbor, how you doing? Hey, come on over, have a cup of tea, have some iced coffee, whatever. And, and you got to know your neighbors air conditioning came along and what happened? We went inside. Next modern convenience uh, that this book highlighted was um, in terms of the neighborhood relationships was the attached garage. Some of you will remember if you look at if you live in an older home or if you know of older homes in your community there are detached garages right and when they're attached um, and even with the invention of the garage door, you can pull, you can pull right up, right into your bat cave, push a button, open the door, pull, pull, pull in, shut it. And you, you can live next to a neighbor for a long, long time and actually never speak to your neighbor next door. Modern conveniences. There's also, and some of you may be too young to know what I'm talking about, but the answering machine changed everything. Those of you who are my age or older, you'll remember that in order to find out who was calling once upon a time, you'd actually have to pick up the phone. Um, and this is stunning to those of you who are younger, I know. The answering machine came along and suddenly you could screen your calls, right? You'd have to wait and listen for the beep and then you could distance yourself. Oh, and the list goes on and on and on and on and on. In fact, one of the most recent developments that's really changing society is the increase of individualized forms of entertainment. Think about this. Those of you who are kind of like my generation or older, back in the day when we were growing up, how did we play and entertain ourselves as kids? What would we do? We would go outside, right? And we would play with other people, <laughs> like kids on our street. Kids, I know, right? Crazy. Now, what's the norm? The norm is you stay inside, you play on your iPad with your own, you know, or, or play with your own PlayStation or whatever the thing is these days. And there's not nearly as much social interaction. The third big challenge that's impacting relationships today is the rise of social media. And we've acknowledged already that it has tremendous blessings. And I use different forms of, of, of social media and I find great benefits from them. But at the same time, it's not the same as face-to-face -face contact. And what one article said, and this is a stunning line, it's really grabbed my attention. The author said, social media is creating an epidemic of deferred loneliness. Just think about that for a moment. You feel a little bit lonely and so you post something on Facebook or you upload a picture on Instagram and or you tweet something um, and then generally speaking you get almost immediate feedback 
almost instant feedback, right? Whoa, someone already liked it, woo -hoo. Someone says, oh, you look really good in your selfie. Yes, I do, I look so good, right? Um, and and you, you get this, this feedback. The problem is, you know internally how little it takes to double click on a picture on Instagram and, and, and just keep on scrolling. And so it doesn't alleviate or eliminate the loneliness. What does it do? It just defers it. It, it defers it. And so many of us, we're, you know, we're going through life with our 400 Facebook friends and yet no one that we could actually call if we really needed to talk and reveal our hearts. And we've got so many other blessings and yet internally, deep down, if we're silent enough to think about it, we actually believe something's not working. We think something's missing. Something's not as it should be. And last week, we decided that it may not be something, it may be someone. Someone's missing, right? And this week, I want to say to you, it might not just be someone that's missing, it could be a group of someone's. And our key thought for today is that you might be one community away from changing the trajectory of your life. You might be one group of strong, committed believers that you do life with in the highs and the lows, those who lift you up and pray for you and encourage you and always have your back. You might be one community away from changing your future, your, your future family, or from changing future generations, from changing uh, the ability to make a difference in this world. You may be one community away from changing the trajectory of your life. Now, perhaps the best example of this is found in the New Testament. The New Testament community found in Acts 2. And, and we're going to take a look at verse 42 and, and on. It reads this. They devoted themselves. Now, believers devoted themselves. It wasn't just a half-hearted thing, right? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer. In other words, it was a community centered around Christ. It wasn't centered around soccer or a neighborhood association. It was centered around Christ. Verse 43, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All of the believers were together and had everything in common. Like we're such a family that anything I have is, is yours. That that was the kind of sentiment. Verse 45, they sold property and possessions to give anyone who had need. In other words, if you're in our family, you don't go without because family takes care of family. Verse 46, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. You may be one community away from changing the trajectory of your life. But I promise you, it just doesn't, you don't stumble on it by accident. A community, you know, not this type of community. You create it with the love of Christ in an intentional way as believers come together. So what I want to do is this, because I know you want this um, and you need this. Um, I want to give you three qualities of great Christian communities. Okay, ready? The first quality is this. What's mine is yours. That's, that's the first thing. For years, um, Brian and I hosted youth groups in our home and, and, and more recently life groups. And, and we've made it clear to those who kind of become part of our, our community that we're, we'll serve you, we'll serve you, you know, our, your tea or coffee once. And then you feel at home. You don't need to knock on the door. You just come on in. You help yourself. You have refrigerator rights, right? Because you are family. In fact, that's what we, they had in Acts, Acts 2, 44. All believers were together and they had everything in common. How many people outside of your family have refrigerator rights in your life, right? Or think about it this way. How many other people outside of your family do you have refrigerator rights in their life? And I would say to you, if you tell me none, then you uh, may not have what all that God wants for you to have. You may be relationally impoverished and you may not even know it. 
because God doesn't want us to have just a personal relationship with him, but a shared relationship with a broader community where we're doing life together. So what's the quality of great communities? Recognizing uh, also that number two, we are flawed. Romans 15, seven tells us that, and this is the power of community, accept one another then <clears throat> just as Christ accepted you. And when we're accepted and loved in the context of a community, Paul actually says this brings praise to God. Isn't that awesome? When we love one another, it brings praise to God. In fact, in scripture, anytime there was someone who was a cripple, who was born with a defect, uh, some sort of challenge, people would say, oh, well, it's because of sin. There must be sin, right? Well, there's this amazing story in the Old Testament about a guy named Mephibosheth. And um, he, as a young child, was in an accident and he was lame in his feet. He couldn't walk. And so society rejected him. But the king had mercy on him and showed him love. And um, of course, I'm talking about King, king David and Mephibosheth's father was Jonathan. Okay, so there's a powerful verse in 2 Samuel 9, verse 13. Listen to this. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. He was lame in both feet. Now, don't miss the power of this. All of society rejected him, but a king accepted him, and he was always at the king's table. He was lame in both feet. And I love this because no one could see his crippled feet because they were covered by the king's table. And I don't know if you found power in that, but we all come. We all come with our flawed and crippled feet and we pull up to the table of the Lord, the king of kings, and we dine together and we love each other enough, even though we are flawed. What's mine is yours. We're all flawed. And the third thing is this, we fight lions. <laughs> a great quality of Christian communities is together we fight lions. Uh, 1 Peter 5, 8 tells us this, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. We do have a spiritual enemy who wants to devour, to, to pick you off, to steal, to, to kill, to destroy everything that matters to the things of God. I saw a video on YouTube of, of lions um, attacking a, a water buffalo and, um, and how this herd came out, the herd of water buffaloes came out to protect their own. And honestly, it's a really great picture of how we stand together as Christians, right? Just, just think. If water buffaloes can stick together like that, don't you think the church of Jesus Christ can too? Don't you think that we can stand together? We can we're gonna pray for each other. We're going to pray each other through it. You do not go down without the support of others. You don't want to fight cancer alone. You, you don't want to hurt financially alone. You don't want a kid wandering off alone. What you want is you want the strength of the body of Christ standing with you, loving you, praying for you, encouraging you, because if you are alone, you are vulnerable. And some of you, in the midst of all of this, you're vulnerable right now. But I'm telling you, you're one community away of changing the trajectory of your life. And when you have it, it is so rich, it's so satisfying and so meaningful. And the non-believing world, you know, starts looking on and saying, man, you see how they love each other? I mean, how they take care of each other? How they really care about each other? This is truly, you know, I don't, I don't understand what it is. I don't understand it all, but, but oh man, I want that. And suddenly Jesus' words come to life in John 13, 35 that says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. One of the greatest ways to let the light shine in the world is to love those within the family in such a contagious way that others want to have it too. And suddenly you can say, well, it's not because we're good. It's because God is good and God has transformed us.
And you can have that kind of love too. It's called Christianity. And the Lord Jesus Christ, who loved us so much, was willing to die. And because of what he did, that's why we're this way. That's what we say. Some of you have relational poverty and perhaps didn't even realize it. You are one community away from changing the trajectory of your life. But it's not going to happen by accident. You've got to be it to have it. Amen. Would you join me as we pray? Father, I pray that you would stir up your church, that we would be the church to love one another with your unconditional love. God, help us to be the church so full of your love that others want what we have and we could share the goodness of Christ with them. God, you are a relational God. You created us to show us your love to others. So in doing so, we can love you back. We pray these things in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. Stay tuned for next week where we will conclude this sermon series entitled Friendship in the Time of COVID. We look forward to seeing you then. In the meantime, be well. God bless you. It's friendship, friendship, just a perfect friendship. When other friendships have been for great, yeah. ours will still be great. A laddle, daddle, daddle, chuck, chuck, chuck.